Good morning, Rooted family. We would like to say happy 22nd anniversary to our church family, to all of our families and our friends that worship with us um, throughout the year. We thank God for your faithfulness. We thank God for your diligence. And most of all, we thank you for being a part of our family. We ask that you would just continue to trust God in this season. Continue to look forward to great things because we serve an awesome God. And remember in everything and in all things that our God, he still reigns. God bless you. Amen. We want to truly um, thank the Lord for the preach that we have this morning on our 22nd anniversary. We have a great man of God that's going to present to Rudy Bible a great word in the person of uh, Pastor Alfonso Higgins. He's a pastor of, of Community Baptist Church, a good friend of mine, a good friend for over 30 years. And so we're looking forward to hearing a word from Pastor Alfonso Higgins. Hear he him, the word of God. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. God bless. Amen. I want to say good morning to everyone, to uh, Pastor uh, Webster and to Rooted Bible Fellowship and all who are listening in this morning, watching this morning. Indeed, it is an honor and a privilege uh, to be here with you today, uh, to celebrate uh, with you today uh, 22 uh, years a pastor and a church that's standing up for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so we come here to uh, fellowship with you and to celebrate what God has done in the life of your pastor and the life of this great church. Amen. 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 I want to ask that... Uh, if you have a copy of the scriptures, that uh, you might turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, all who are able to stand, will you? And uh, we're going to read the first six verses. And uh, I'm reading from the New King James, and it says this. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, and that I may present you as a church chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness. And so your minds may be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it for I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles second Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 through 6 may God bless the reading and the hearing of his word I, I want to share with you today just before we go into prayer I want to share with you today from the from the theme the heart of a godly pastor the heart of a godly pastor. Let's look to the Lord. Our God and our Father, we, we do thank you. We do praise you for this glory and wonderful opportunity to stand behind the sacred desk and to represent you in your kingdom to the glory of God. Now, Lord, as we come to celebrate with our friend, Pastor Webster, and the Rooted Bible Fellowship, we pray your presence. We pray your guidance, your leading in this service today. We might lift you up, that you might be glorified, that you might be honored in all that we do and say. Bless this waiting congregation, I pray, O oh Lord. Open our ears and our hearts that we might receive the truth. Pray for those that are listening in and who are far from the peaceful shores. Draw them, use them by hearing the word of God, that they may come to you. Now, we pray these things, that you be glorified in all that we do and say. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. You know, I am...
truly grateful. And from the depth of my heart, for godly men leaders who believe the truth, I am truly grateful in my heart for godly men leaders who stand on the truth. And I'm truly grateful from the bottom of my heart for godly men who lives lives the truth. It is without question that you here at Rooted have a pastor who falls into all three categories. If you know that's true, say amen. I have known your pastor for about three decades or maybe a little longer. He has always had a passion for God's word since he has been a Christian. He had a passion in knowing it. He had a passion in memorizing it. He had a passion in wanting others to know and to understand it. If you ever, if we ever, in the 21st century, needed more pastors, it is definitely in this century in which we live. And so this morning, I, I want to uh, share with you, as the Apostle Paul shared his heart with the believers at the Corinthian church. And I want to share and, and show you the heart of a godly pastor. All godly pastors should do so because they love their people and are true under shepherds of God's people, his flock. There are four things that I, that I see here about a godly pastor that I want to bring out and the church that's under him. If you observe, again, in verse 1, it said, Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. The first thing uh, the Apostle Paul brings out, I see here, that the heart of a godly pastor protects his flock. He protects his flock against hollerings. False teachers. Paul here is standing strong against the false apostles who came and tried to undermine his ministry and turn the flock away from him. And Paul is, is reaffirming in the heart of the people that you got to stand strong and what I've been telling you is true. But I want you to know that Jesus reminds us that a godly pastor, he said, the good shepherd. That's what I like about Ruth, because you got a good shepherd. Jesus said that the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a harlan, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming. Slick jokers. Dressed down, $300, $400 shoes and all that stuff. You know, he, he said, he see the Harlan coming. He see these guys. He said, and, 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 and these Harlanders, they, they, they don't own the sheep, he says. Sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flee. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. But that's not the heart of a godly pastor. See, the godly pastor, he protects, Paul says. And we see in verse 1, he protects the flock, keeps them in a strong and narrow way. See, doesn't turn his head on sin. Stands up because he loves you, because he cares about you. You see, a godly pastor, he's not doing it for prestige. Uh, see, you see, a godly pastor, he's not doing it for the glory of men. See, a godly pastor 
He's not doing it for the money. Though he may, though he must live. And you ought to pay him. But the center of his ministry is not about money. It's about the souls of men and women, perfecting them for the work of the ministry. And seeing disciples come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I come to tell you, that's the first mark of a godly pastor. Paul goes on. He doesn't stop there. Let's, let's notice verse 2. Let's notice the, 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 the second one. In verse 2, he says, for I am jealous for you. With godly jealous, if I have betrothed you to one husband, that he may present to you as a church chaste version to Christ. Listen to me. Not only does a godly pastor protect his flock from false teachers, from false teaching, excuse me, and false teachers, but he loves them so much that if one tries to take his place, he is jealous. You know, my father-in-law, I thought back then, was a real jealous man. Bro, I'm going to tell you something. You know how the Bible says embrace one another. And when we, when we could do that. And I'm sure brother, Pastor West don't, don't get mad if I embrace sister, the sister, uh, my wife, or one of y'all. You know, a, a, a brother, sister, Christian embrace. Well, my father-in-law, boy, he didn't play that. But I remember listening to Vernon McGee. He's dead and gone now. And Vernon McGee challenged me. He said, if you are a husband and you ain't jealous over your wife, something wrong. Something wrong. And I want you to know that the Bible said that God is jealous. He's a jealous God over his wife, over Israel then and over the church. Listen to Exodus 34, verse 14. For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord whose name is jealous, hallelujah, is a jealous God. He's a jealous God. I come to tell you this morning that a godly pastor is jealous over his flock. And, 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 and listen now, Paul's going to give this great analogy. I want you to track with me now. We're going to go back and we're going to look at some history in Israel. He talks about presenting her as a chaste virgin. And Paul compares the Corinthian believers and all of us to a Jewish wedding which starts with the patrol or what we call in our time engagement and then the actual ceremony the betrothal usually lasted about a year the betrothal couple though not allowed to consummate the union physically was legally regarded as husband and wife the betrothal could only be broken by death divorce and unfaithfulness. Track with me now. During the patrol period, it was, I want you to listen to this. It says, during the patrol period, it was the father's responsibility to ensure his daughter remained faithful to her pledged husband. I'm going somewhere. Uh, he would then present her to him at the wedding ceremony as a pure virgin. When Paul preached the gospel to the Corinthian believers, he betrothed them to the one husband who was Jesus. We've been betrothed to Jesus. Huh? This happened at salvation. And then we, the Corinthian church, they and we, we pledge our loyalty to Christ. And Paul wanted to make sure they remained faithful as their spiritual father. Paul was determined to present them as a pure virgin to Christ 
a godly pastor is a jealous pastor over his flock that he might present them to the husband as a pure virgin. Praise God. A godly pastor not only protects, but a godly pastor is jealous over his flock. He's going to watch them and care for them. And one day that you might be presented as a pure virgin. Is that good? Amen. Amen. And I tell you, I praise God for steadfast, unmovable pastors like Pastor Webster. He's truly been a friend. And I'm not trying to uh, build him up and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, influence you. I'm telling you what I've seen all my life. We had some great times. You would have heard the story. Going to Bible college. You know, Pastor Webster, you know, he kind of put his head down because Pastor Higgins, you know, I, I'm going to talk. I'm going to ask questions. And we get into these great theological battles. But you know what? It's been a great blessing to walk alongside. How can we walk together unless we agree? You have a great pastor and you have a great church. And a great pastor, a godly pastor, does what Paul is saying. He protects the flock and he is indeed jealous over his flock. Thirdly, look at verse 3 and 4. He says, but I fear. He said, but I fear lest somehow the serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in the gospel. Don't ever think that you can't. Listen, she did not purposely do what she did. The Bible says she was deceived in doing what she did. What it says. She was deceived. And that's why it's important that she stay in that word. Sunday morning as your pastor preached that word and teach that word. Wednesday nights, women's Bible uh, ministries and men's Bible ministries and different things. Stay in that word. Do devotions every day. Pray. If we could not be deceived, the Holy Spirit would have never put in the Bible that we could be deceived. The best of us can. And that's why we got to stay strong in the word and in prayer. So thirdly, a, God, a godly pastor has a healthy fear for his people, or as one translation put it, I am afraid for you. And Dr. John McArthur, one of the great preachers of the 20, 21st century, 50 years in one church, unheard of. And this is what he said in his commentary in 2 Corinthians, and I quote, he says this, it is every pastor's fear that some of his sheep might go astray. See, a good pastor, he fears that, and, and he's concerned about that. See, church, church discipline is never to condescend upon you or to put you down. It is to bring you back to saneness because when we go astray, we're insane. <laughs> Are you with me? Church discipline is never to put you down. Church discipline is because we love you, we care about you, and we want you to have the fullness of all that God has for you and me. So when we get crazy, we begin to do things and justify things. It's amazing how believers in marriage and relationship can justify things because they have gotten blinded, sidetracked, got their feet dirty, and lost their way. As noted above, it was Paul's zeal for their purity that caused the daily pressure on him of concern for all the churches. I'm still quoting Dr. John MacArthur, 2 Corinthians 11, 28. A heartbreaking theme throughout history is the disloyalty of many who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ 
Countless churches that name the name of Christ have been seduced by deceitful spirits. Teaching doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, and become disloyal to him. But the apostle Peter, again, godly pastors are reminded as the apostle Peter makes clear in 1 Peter chapter 5, starting at verse 2, listen to what he says. The elders. And then and let me say, you know, um, you will always see the New Testament church a plurality of elders. You will never, ever see a church where in the New Testament where it's not a plurality of elders. It says, the elders who are among you I exhort. This is Peter. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ. And also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Isn't that good? He said, oh man, that's going to be some glory. It's going to be revealed. But that's only to godly and faithful pastors. See? See, you don't have to have a mega church and be all over the world to receive this. Oh, you got to be as a faithful pastor. And one thing I know, this man has been a faithful pastor. Peter goes on. He doesn't stop there. He says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Let me tell you something. There's no one that has more enthusiasm to have a willing heart than Pastor Webster. You know, um, we were cleaning the church some years ago, cleaning around the parking lot and doing all these kind of things and everything. And, you know, Pastor Higgins, I get in, you know, I put boots on the ground. I, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm out there with them. And those jugglers, man, they talking about, man, pastor, you're a Hebrew slave driver, man. The women fix lunch for it and all, and they talking about, man, we got to cool down. I said, man, y'all go on inside and get something to eat. Sit down, I'm, you know. What am I saying? Pastor Weston has a, a tenacious, a, 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 a drive. He's not trying to prove something. He wants the most for all of us. And that's what he says. Among you serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And you know, here's the good thing. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Does that mean there's no down times? No, that's not true. Does, 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 does that mean that he never felt like throwing in the towel? No, I don't believe that's true either. But it means that he's going to keep his eyes on Jesus. He's going to persevere through it all. Because you know what? He knows that one day he's going to meet the chief shepherd. Isn't that good? See, when I think about all of the misfortunes and the trouble in America and prejudice and all the things that are going on and though it's real and we do all that we can do see I know in the end there's somebody his name is Jesus going to set it right and he's going to expose you and he's going to bring it right and make it right see one day every knee going to bow every tongue going to confess that he is Lord. Now it's better to do it now. But you're going to do it. It's going to happen. Why not get it out the way now? Now you can bow now. You're going to bow later. But you will bow. Pastor Webster wants to get us prepared. That he might say well done. My good and my faithful 
servant. Your pastor deeply loves and cares for you. He will always, like in Acts 20, when Paul said, and this is what Paul said in Acts 20, for I have not shunned, talking to the elders from Miletus, and he called them down, and Paul said, you can never point to me or say about me that I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27. Let me tell you something. One thing we'll never be able to say, that this godly pastor has not shunned to share with us the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Amen? Root it. You have shown great love to your pastor and the work of God in this church. And I want to encourage you. Keep it up until God calls you home, him home, and all of us home. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Then we come to the final standard in verses 5 and 6 we come to the final standard yet i am not in knowledge but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things here's the fourth thing the godly pastor is not inferior or intimidated by the theatrical preacher but committed to being a pastor teacher of Ephesians 4.11. Listen, is Pastor Higgins jumping on a man who runs all over the church and walks on the pews and all? No, as long as he's preaching the gospel. But he's not intimidated. I, I can remember, and, <laughs> and be careful what I say, but I can remember, you know, uh, 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 certain preachers and, and uh, uh, being at a certain church and I mean, the brother hadn't even said anything. He was just was nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's maybe the way God made him. But I'm just saying that, you know, you'd have thought that Jesus saved or something. They, the people jumped all over the place, and you know, and I'm like, but a godly pastor is not an inferior or intimidated by the theatrical preacher. Now listen. Wrote this in my notes. Make sure I say it right. I say this because Paul was probably the greatest educated Christian that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. Acts 22, verse 3. And I'm going to share with you. See, Paul was not saying that he don't know and he wasn't trained. He's just saying that I'm not like the theatrical apostles, these false apostles. I'm going to make it clear to you. And, and the Bible makes it clear to you. So let's find out who was Paul. Let me tell you something. See, if Paul was living in the 21st century, he had a degree from Harvard and maybe Browns. <laughs> huh? Dallas. He'd be fluent in Hebrew and Greek and who knew whatever languages. But notice what he says. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 8. Track along with me. This man was awesome. As a matter of fact, when I studied Greek, a little bit of Greek that I did, one thing I learned is that when you read the Apostle John Greek, it's like, Mary, see the cat. But when you read Paul's Greek, you better have a dictionary. Listen what it says. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. And, uh, uh, he says, and indeed, he said, I am indeed a Jew. Why does he say that? Because he wasn't a mixed up Samaritan. He was pure Jewish. Are you with me? He says, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Let me tell you how important it is. When John MacArthur went to seminary, he did his homework because he wanted to set under one of the best professors in the known world. He went to Trinity and he did. 
And that's what Paul is saying. I sat under the most knowledgeable, godly man in the Jewish community. I got this thing. He said, I sat under the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you are all today. Paul goes on to say that all this stuff that I knew and learned mounted up the donkey do without Jesus. It means nothing. Education is good, good education. My pastor used to say, education without salvation leads to frustration. Isn't that good? <laughs> Leads to, leads to nothing. No godly pastor, no godly pastor will not protect his flock, is zealous over his flock, has a healthy fear for his flock, and is not intimidated or inferior over his flock. Truly, listen, God has blessed this church. I remember from the very beginning, way back in Pastor House, when he started. And God has brought you guys a long ways and has blessed you to be a great influence in this community. And we thank God. There's no doubt in my mind that God called him and, and led him and brought you where you are today. Truly, God has blessed this church with a godly pastor and this pastor with a great church. May you continue another 22 years. We pray God's continued blessing upon you from this day on. And I want to close, as we have talked about the heart of a godly pastor, I pray that you would take to heart these things, that you continue to walk with your pastor and to be a blessing to this church in this community. And I want to close with a poem. William Banks. Some of you might know Dr. William Banks, one of the first pioneers, black theologian and pastor and all. And uh, I don't know who it is written by, but it doesn't say, but I'm going to read this as we close. This is to all of us. Pastor and the church, to all of us. This is what it says. I think that I shall never see a church that's all it ought to be. A church whose members never stray beyond the straight and the narrow way. A church that has no empty pews, whose pastor never has the blues. A church whose deacons always deek, and none is proud and all are meek. Whose gossipers never peddle lies or make complaints or criticize. We're all are always sweet and kind. To all of other faults are blind. Such perfect churches there may be, but none of them is known to me. Be still. We'll work and pray and plan to make our own church the best we can. May God bless you, and may heaven richly smile upon each and every one of you. Amen? Amen. If you're here today or you out in the audience, one of the best decisions you can ever make is to turn your life over to Jesus. I want you to know that I appeal to you. 
I appeal to you, Pastor Webster the same and believers, not to put a notch in our belt. Not to add another member to our church as, as, as good as that is and, and as wonderful that ought to be. But the reason we appeal to you is because the Bible says you're an enemy of God. Because if you don't have peace with God, then you're his enemy. But God loves you, whoever you are and wherever you are, you're looking in or you're here, so much that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our substitute, to take our place, to fill the gap. Now, God's not going to force himself on you, and he's not going to twist your arm. But he's going to appeal to you. And I want to I wanna appeal to you that if you haven't come to Christ, that you come. The day is a day of salvation. And, and, and you know, you, you just can't keep putting off. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And I know, especially when you're young, you think that I got all day and I got plenty of time. But you may. You may have another, who knows, 50 years. But you may not. And if you would just acknowledge, as the Bible says, that you are a sinner. Because the Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you would just acknowledge that. And then if you would invite Jesus Christ, our Lord, to come into your heart. Romans 10, 13 says that whosoever adds Christ into their heart will be saved. And if you would just acknowledge that. And invite him to come into your life. To acknowledge you a sinner. And, and ask him to come to be your Lord and Savior. He'll save you right now. Will you do that? Will you do that? So if there is one in our audience. Who's looking on. Or one sitting in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the area. The sanctuary. Would you stand and acknowledge. And give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to come and pray with you and talk to you about the things of God. Is there one? Amen. And if you out there in the audience, and if you have turned to Christ, right pastor, West, right rooted, let them know. And say they can send you something and fellowship and, and uh, glory with you in your new walk with Jesus. Amen. Amen. So may God bless you to Pastor Webster. We love you, our brother. And we wish you many, many, many more years. Keep on, keep it on. Sister Webster, keep standing by his side. And root it, may you keep standing by his side. Amen? And until this is over, let's be steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the things of God. May God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Amen. Pastor Higgins and Sister Joyce, we would thank, like to thank you for coming out to fellowship with us today on our 22nd anniversary. We thank you for yet another great word from the Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness and your diligence. We thank you for your friendship. And we ask that the Lord will continuously bless you and your ministry as well as your family as you continue to push forward in the work of Christ. God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday. Amen. What a great word. We truly thank the Lord for this great man of God presenting to our church a great word as we are truly celebrating 22 years. The Lord has been good to us. Yes. He has brought us a long and mighty way. And Rudy, yes. we just want you to, to keep on pressing, yes. keep on believing Jesus yes. for great things. The Lord had great things in store yes. for Rooted Bible Fellowship Amen. Church. So once again, First Lady and I would like to just thank you. We want to just thank you for being a great church for being a wonderful, wonderful branch of Zion. Yes. Continue to trust the Lord for great things. And yes. even in this season, Amen. he's going to show himself yes, strong. He will.